Good evening, and welcome to our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting at Freedom Baptist Church on YouTube. I'm Pastor Bill, and I am so happy that you and your family could join me tonight. Now, we at Freedom have been studying the Psalms on Wednesdays this past spring and summer. And tonight, at the end of our study, we'll also have a time of prayer, so I encourage you to get a sheet of notebook paper or a notebook, get a pen to take some notes. Also, you can use that to take some prayer requests with your family. And if you're by yourself, have a time of prayer before the Lord uh, by yourself today. Or with your family, make sure you spend time in prayer after our study. And we'll give you some requests to consider and bring before the Lord. Now, we know that the book of Psalms was the hymn book for God's people at the singing of their Shabbat, their Sabbath days, other Jewish festivals, other gatherings for worship, uh, but also personal worship before the Lord. These songs of worship before the Lord are, uh, they have many different aspects. They are psalms of praise. Some have laments and cries unto the Lord. Some have serious questions brought before the Lord. Some declare, many of them declare the glory and the character of God. And several have cries of judgment upon one's enemies. It is this category that we're going to look at tonight and next week. In this past year, in your prayers with other people, or in personal, your personal prayer life, have you heard or have you prayed a prayer like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I have a heavy burden on my heart that I am bringing before you now. It's about my annoying neighbor, Herman. He's an atheist, and he knows I'm a Christian. And he's always making negative comments about Christianity. I've tried being kind to him, Lord, but he is always rude to me. They regularly have loud, wild parties at his house, and he intentionally directs his outdoor speakers towards my yard as if daring me to complain or challenge him. He crumbled up a gospel tract that my kids put on his door, and he threw it back in our yard and yelled at us never to do anything like that again. He is mean and hateful, Lord. He despises you. Would you please stop his wickedness? Let a tree fall on his house, or at least his car. May his wife leave him and his children despise him. Even let his dog attack him, because he does not follow you. Allow him to get paper cuts when he goes out to get his mail, and use that suffering to show him how he makes everyone else suffer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, have you ever heard or prayed a prayer like that? It's kind of silly and rather ridiculous. Um, Pastor Bill... Uh, why would you open our psalm study tonight with a prayer like that? Obviously, when we hear something like that, we, we realize it seems odd, abnormal, comical, and obviously inappropriate. And although I have never found a prayer like that, by the way, that was a made-up prayer. I don't have a neighbor named Herman, and none of those things are true. I'm thankful for the neighborhood in which I live. However, I have found a prayer, prayers in the Psalms that read like this. Oh my God, consume them, speaking of the psalmist enemies. Consume them in wrath, consume them that they may not be, Psalm 59, 13. Or try this one. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Psalm 69, 23 and 28. How about this one? Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Wow. 
Psalm 109, 8 through 9. This one's probably the most shocking of all. Psalm 137, 8 to 9. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Wow. They're not like the made-up prayer that I made, but they are rather serious, aren't they? rather shocking. When we read verses like that in the Bible, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? What do you first think of? Well, first I think we're shocked. And then we pause and we do a double take or a triple take. We scratch our heads and then the questions come. Did I just read what I just read? Is that really in there? Does God approve of the psalmist praying that? Or did he just allow their sinful, emotional, angry thoughts to be recorded? Or just their basic human emotions to be recorded? Is it okay for us to pray prayers like this against our enemies today as Christians? Should we wish for the children of our enemies to be harmed or destroyed? Shocking, powerful questions. We will get to several of those answers over the next two weeks. But let me ask you this. Why are you shocked when you hear something like that? Why am I shocked when I hear a prayer or a psalm like that? We're not supposed to pray those things about our enemies, right? Isn't that the thought we have? Why not? Because what did Jesus teach us in Matthew 5, 43? What did he say? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So what do we have going on here? It appears that one part of the Bible is saying one thing. You have a scripture writer calling down judgment and destruction of his enemies. And you have another part of scripture, the words of Jesus, telling his followers to love their enemies. It seems like it's contradictory. So why is that a problem? Because the Bible itself claims to be the pure word of God without error. God cannot contradict himself. How can one part of God's word be true, another part be false, and God not be a liar? We know that he is not a liar, so his word is true. And sometimes we do run into things in the scriptures that appear to contradict, and this is one of those very difficult topics. I do not believe that there has ever been a diligent student of the Psalms that has not run across at least some of these difficult passages and has not been puzzled by the apparent conflict with Jesus' teaching in the New Testament and other parts of Scripture. So over the next two weeks, we are going to look at the imprecatory Psalms as a topic, as a category. Impreca what? <laughs> imprecatory psalms. That's the title these sections of the psalms have been given by other Bible scholars. Imprecatory. Can you say that with me? Imprecatory. And if you want to give up, that's okay. But keep listening. We're going to find out what that means in just a moment. And we're not going to look at just one psalm tonight as our other uh, Bible teachers have been doing in our psalm series. They've just been focusing on one psalm uh, or a few of the smaller psalms together. We're going to look at various passages over these next two weeks. Tonight we're going to look at two specific psalms, two of the psalms that seem to have the most imprecatory language and verses within them. And we're going to answer some of these tough questions. Is there a contradiction here? How can God truly be okay with these psalms? Are we supposed to be having 
to be praying imprecatory psalms today? So again, grab a notebook or some paper and a pen and let's study God's word together. But first, let's pray. Father, I thank you for every person that you have brought to our YouTube channel tonight. Whether they are watching tonight, Wednesday, August 12th, or whether they will watch in the next several weeks or even months and years beyond. Lord, I pray that everyone listening would humble our hearts before you, that we would set aside distractions that would hinder us from hearing your word. I pray that we would be confident in who you are, that we would grow in our love for your word. If there's anyone here who cannot call you Lord, who does not know Jesus as Savior, I pray that you would stir their heart to come to you this very night. Now bless our time as we study this difficult topic. Give us your grace and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, we are looking at imprecatory psalms. The title of our study tonight, you can write this down, is Impreca what? <laughs> Impreca what? Curses in the Psalms. So what is a definition of imprecatory psalms? This is the word. It's that $50 word uh, you can learn to say and share. But what does it mean? Imprecatory psalms have imprecation in them. Pastor Bill, what are you doing? Well, imprecation and imprecate, these are words related to imprecatory. The first word is a noun, and the second ver word is a verb. The noun, imprecation, is a curse, and the verb, imprecate, means to invoke a curse or to call out a curse on one's enemies. Imprecatory psalms are those psalms that contain sections where the psalmist invoked judgment, calamity, or curses upon his enemies or those perceived as enemies of God. Now one commentator, Daniel Michael Nairbass, in his book Praying Curses, calls imprecatory psalms a misnomer. There are no psalms that are completely comprised of these curses. There's no psalms that all the verses are only curses upon one's enemies. In fact, typically the psalms contain various elements. As I mentioned earlier, one psalm can have praises, laments, questions before God, cries to God for help, and verses of imprecation or curses upon enemies. As we approach this topic tonight, um, I want to look at, I want us to consider two helpful reminders, and you can write these down. Two helpful reminders. First of all, we're facing something that looks like it's contradicting. And God has written to us in his word, we're reading something in his word, and at first glance, it doesn't seem to fit, and we don't have an answer for us. So let me encourage you with this. Number one, the struggle is real. This is not a simple little issue. This is not a Bible preschool lesson. Uh, this is not a matter that should be no problem for the average Christian or Bible student to understand. This is a head scratcher. It is difficult. It is something that takes focus and study as we look at it. So don't be afraid of it, and I'm glad you've come to join me on this journey of digging into God's Word. There are great scholars that have struggled with these psalms, Bible scholars that you are probably familiar with and that we respect, um, biblical authors, uh, uh, authors that have written good Christian books, um, very intelligent Christians have struggled with these things. One is C.I. Schofield. Any of you ever heard of C.I. Schofield? Who has had a Schofield reference Bible? I know 
the more familiar reference Bibles to us today are the Ryrie Study Bible or the MacArthur Study Bible. But most likely, if your parents and grandparents are Christians and they were students of God's Word, they probably had a Schofield reference Bible. C.I. Schofield uh, called in precatory psalms a cry unsuited to the church. That doesn't mean he didn't believe in them or didn't think we should study them, but it didn't fit our church mindset of what um, the Bible and Christianity should be. C.S. Lewis. How many of you have ever read C.S. Lewis? This is his quote about this matter. At the outset, I felt sure and feel sure still that we must not either try to explain in precatory psalms away or to yield for one moment to the idea that because it comes in the Bible, all this vindictive hatred must somehow be good and pious. We must face both facts squarely. The hatred is there, festering, gloating, undisguised. And also, we should be wicked if we in any way condoned or approved it, or worse still, used it uh, to justify similar passions in ourselves. So you can see that even C.S. Lewis struggled with this. Now, whether we agree with his conclusions on that, that is another matter. But he struggled with these things. And then C.H. Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, as he was called, described and had this to say about the imprecatory psalms. Truly, this is one of the hard places of Scripture. Yet, as it is a psalm unto God, given by inspiration, it is not ours to sit in judgment upon it, but to bow our ear to what God the Lord would speak to us therein. So, it is a struggle. If it was a struggle for Schofield and C.S. Lewis and Charles H. Spurgeon, it's going to be a struggle for us. But we can grow, we can understand, and I'm glad you've joined me tonight. Again, it's not just in this struggle, it's not just the imprecatory psalms against Jesus' word in the Sermon on the Mount, but um, let's look at what Jesus said. This is one of the main reasons why we probably struggle with this. We were taught this in Sunday school. Our parents probably shared this with us. When we come to Christ, this is a thing we read and are reminded of. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Also, Jesus gives us the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That does not seem to be compatible with David, the psalmist, most of the psalms that have imprecatory language are ascribed to David, a man after God's own heart. But this loving your enemies doesn't seem to fit with David calling down God's judgment on his enemies, does it? Well, this isn't the only place where we see this struggle. There are verses in the Old Testament on how to treat your enemies. Did you know that? This isn't just the Old Testament against the New Testament. In Leviticus 19, Jesus said, love your neighbor as your, or not Jesus, uh, <laughs> the law says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's where Jesus quoted 
from. He quoted from Leviticus 19. In Proverbs 24, let's look at these passages here. Proverbs 24, 17 through 18. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Did God in the Old Testament, in this book of wisdom in Proverbs, want us to be thrilled when our enemies go down, when they stumble, when they fall? Um, this is a thought and an idea in the Proverbs. Now let's try uh, Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Does that sound familiar to you? Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 12. And then, of course, what is it that we hear the most? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Where, where did he say vengeance is mine? He said that in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, 35. And then the Apostle Paul quotes it again in the New Testament. So, it's interesting that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we hear truth from God about how to respond to our enemies. But also, in the Old Testament, we see imprecation upon enemies, calls for judgment upon enemies in the Old Testament, and we see it in the New Testament. We see it with Jesus, where he said, woe to the cities of Chorazin. He said, uh, uh, woe to Jerusalem. We see... Um, other calls upon judgment. He called Herod a fox. What did he say to the Pharisees? He called, Jesus called them brood of vipers, and he called condemnation on them. The Apostle Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians, those who do not love the Lord Jesus, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. So there are elements of warning and judgment against wrongdoers and calls for their destruction and judgment. And it is in both testaments. So, this is a real problem. It is a head scratcher, but we don't have to be afraid of it. And we're going to continue to look through this. Secondly, we must make sure we look at the larger context of the psalm in which we find the curses or the imprecatory language. Now tonight we're going to look at two, uh, just briefly, we're not going to completely expound on them, and we may have another teacher take one of these psalms on another, uh, on another Wednesday night. But as I look at at these psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. These are the two psalms that have some of the greatest amount of imprecatory verses and language and calls for curses upon one's enemies. So it's important, don't just look at the verses where we see the confusing language. Let's look at the broader context of what is going on with this psalmist. What is the background? What are they saying to the Lord? We don't want to take these verses out of context. We want to look at them in the context of each psalm, and we can take the rest of the context of the scriptures, as we've already done, into consideration. So turn to Psalm 69. Turn to Psalm 69. And let's begin with these first few verses to see what's going on with this particular psalmist. This is ascribed as a psalm of David. 
but we don't have a specific situation written here that, uh, that, we, that we may know what was going on in David's life, but we know that David did face a lot of enemies. Now listen to what he says. Verse 1, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I think in the deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. And then I restored that which I took not away. In these first four verses, we see David is lamenting to God. He's crying for help, crying for God to save him. His enemies uh, are around him, and he is struggling. He is uh, facing such great difficulty. But David also doesn't just focus on the struggle he's facing. He focuses on his own heart. Verses 5 and 6. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from me. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. There's an implication here where David is recognizing, yes, he has enemies. Yes, he's going through a hard time. But also, he's not completely innocent. He has failures and struggles, and he is repenting before the Lord, acknowledging his failures to the Lord, and he asks the Lord to help him not be a hindrance or a stumbling block to those who are truly trying to seek him. But David goes on, verses 7 and following, Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. So David, again, isn't just suffering here because of his own failures. He is suffering because he's following the Lord. He has a zeal and a passion for the house of the Lord. But those that despise that and despise the worship of the Lord are despising David and persecuting him. Verse 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. They reproached him when he fasted. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. He was ridiculed and made fun of. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, and in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. So what do we hear? What do we see here? We see David seeking after God to help him. We see David confessing his sin. We see David talking about he is being ridiculed and approached, reproached, made fun of, persecuted for following God. And he asks God for help once again. We're not going to read every verse, but as we go down, verse 19, look at what David says now. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, we, uh, there's also aspects here. The Messianic Psalms are often intertwined with some of these imprecations and imprecatory psalms, and we will briefly talk about that. 
next week. So hold on uh, if you have questions or thoughts there. But David is saying they are still, they, there's no one to help me. They are all ridiculing me. Now David has focused on God for help. He's cried out to the Lord. He's even admitted his own failure. He's talked about how he has sought God, but he has still been reproached and made fun of. He's asked the Lord for help. Now listen to him in these next verses. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare. Let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually shake. Pour out thou indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those who thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. That seems very harsh doesn't it? Why wouldn't David want them to experience righteousness? Well, let's keep going. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up upon high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. And it goes on. So yes, David in his agony and his persecution before his enemies is crying out to the Lord. And then he proclaims and asks God to judge his enemies. But then he continues to praise the Lord. Is this just a man being vindictive and wanting his enemies to die? When we look in the broader context, we see David looking to God for help, appealing to God's righteousness. These enemies are not just opposing David, they are opposing God because David was uh, God's chosen and God's anointed. So there is no way we completely cover this topic tonight and even next week, but hopefully you are getting your uh, whistles wetted and uh, your appetites increased into studying God's Word. Let's briefly look at Psalm 109. This is the one that has some of the most um, recognizable language of, of the imprecatory psalms that, we, that you may be familiar with. This psalm is another psalm of David, and we don't have the specific incident um, uh, ascribed to or recognized. But again, in the first few verses, we see David's agony. Hold not the pe thy peace, O God, of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they are rewarded... They have rewarded me evil for good and hated and hatred for my love. David is in agony and pain here. He is suffering emotions. When someone steps on your foot or kicks you in the gut, how do you feel about them or punches you in the gut? You have a reaction of, why'd you do that? I'm going to get back at you. That is a human Response: David is in agony here on what his enemies are doing to him. And then this is where the very popular verses of imprecation come. Verse 6, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any 
to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of, it, of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that they may be cut off, that they that he may cut off the memory of them from earth, because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in a blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as the garment which covereth him, and for a girdle wherewith he is girdled continually. Let this be the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord, and of them that speak evil against my soul. But do thou for me, O God the Lord, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. We see some pretty harsh things that David says about his enemy. But it is, it is in the context of agony and pain, but also before his God. These enemies were sinning against God. And David ultimately appears, appeals to the mercy of God. And he wraps up his psalm with praise. Verse 26, Help me, O Lord my God, O save me according to thy mercy, that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou, Lord, hast done it. Let them curse, but bless thou. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. Let mine adversaries be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those that condemn him his soul. What was David saying here? He was wanting God to sovereignly work. He was wanting God's name to be glorified. He didn't want the enemies to win and God's name to continue to be defamed. He wanted God's name to be praised. So, looking at the deeper context of these two main psalms filled with imprecatory language, what is the main focus of the psalmist? Is it vengeance? Is it getting back? Is it the death of the enemy? Or is it God's name? Is it his righteousness? Is it the Lord's sake? Is it God's praise? I think that's what it is. I think his focus is also, God, I need your help. He knows the only one who can help him is God. So that's why he is calling unto the Lord. Well, we are going to continue this study next week. We're going to answer more of these questions and look a little deeper. But let me ask you this. This may be puzzling to you, but do you have enemies? Some of us may have not had many enemies in life. Uh, for our grandparents and great-grandparents who grew up in wartime, really seeing what World War I and World War II was all about, um, they got a feel of the enemy. Those who lived in uh, Europe during World War I and World War II and saw, uh, were treated horribly and saw the devastation and, and uh, those who experienced Hitler's and Mussolini's uh, horrible actions and, and, and others who persecuted them, they, those folks have an understanding of great suffering and sorrow and would understand this concept of, God, I need your help, save me, rescue me, and the feeling of what enemies do, and those who are, are corrupt and evil and do awful things. But in your own life, do you have 
someone who you feel is against you. Maybe it's even a family member who mistreats you or hurts you or, or berates you or you struggle with. Are you suffering at the hands of others? What is your focus when you go through that? Is it on getting back? Is it winning against them? Is it having the last word? Is it making sure they never do this again? Or is your focus on looking to the Lord for help? Is your focus on how can I point others to God? Is your focus on God's righteousness? Folks, when we see wrongdoing, we should hate it. We should despise it. And we should want to stop it and fix the problem if we can. But, do we come from our perspective of getting back or God's perspective of He is holy. He wants us to stand up for righteousness. I think we've got one or two ditches here. We either retaliate in our own sinful anger or we don't stand up against wrongdoing and we put up with it and we let it go on. Now sometimes you may have no choice, but there is a balance here. And I think studying the imprecatory Psalms can help us look at God's holiness and God's righteousness and wanting to stand for Him. But that's not going to erase our responsibility to pray for our enemies, to love them, to recognize that their greatest need is salvation. Their greatest need is the Lord. So how will you approach your enemies this week? Will you pray for them? Will you seek to stand up for what, it's, what is right? Will you also seek to view things the way that God does in righteousness? Oh, may that be our desire. We will continue this study in our imprecatory psalms next week. But first, let me encourage you to spend time in prayer with your family tonight. And I encourage you to ask your group that is there. Maybe you're with another family. Maybe you're with family members or friends. Or maybe it's just you. Take prayer requests. Write some prayer requests down that you're burdened about. Take prayer requests from the group and gather together in prayer. Let me give you four prayer requests to think about. First of all, would you think of someone you know, believer, who is unsaved, who needs the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? Get that person in your mind that you know that needs the Lord. Someone you live with, someone in your neighborhood, someone you work with, a loved one who lives far away that you only get to call or email or FaceTime. Get that person in your mind right now. Would you write them down? Would you pray for their salvation today? Secondly, would you pray for Freedom Baptist Church, our whole entire church? Let's pray for God's direction and leading at, at Freedom. Let's pray for our leaders, our pastors and deacons. Let's pray that we would continue to impact others for Christ. Let's pray for financial provision here at FBC. God can take care of our deficits and he can strengthen us spiritually Let's pray that we will grow numerically and spiritually, that we'll bring more people to our church, that we'll contact more people with the gospel and reach others for Christ and that others can grow in Christ. Let's pray for our missionaries during this time. So that second category, pray for Freedom Baptist Church. Thirdly, pray for a specific Freedom family or member. Can you think of someone? Maybe think of someone that you don't think anyone else will think of. Uh, get one of your Freedom family friends in mind and pray for them. Maybe you know specifically what someone is struggling with and going through. Bring that family before the Lord. And then finally, can you think of an enemy in your life? Or maybe an enemy to the church? An enemy in our country, in our world? Um, someone specific in your life or even 
If you can't think of someone, pray for those around the world who are persecuting Christians. Let's pray that God would stop these enemies from doing what they're doing, but that he would also draw these enemies to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So will you pray for those four things and the other requests with your families? I will get you started and then you can continue your prayer time. Let's close. Father, thank you for this time that we've had to study your word. Thank you that even though we face some difficult things that we read in your word, you still have answers for us and your word is true. Lord, even when we face tough times and we face our enemies, you still have answers for us. Father, I pray that we would get a greater understanding of your character and who you are. I pray that you would help all of our unsaved loved ones to come to know you and use us to be a witness for you. I pray for Freedom Baptist Church that you would direct our pastors and our deacons in, in the decisions that we make. I pray that you would provide for us financially and spiritually, bring more people our way to our churches, our church services, use us to impact and share the gospel with others, help us to impact others for Christ, and provide for our missionaries all around the globe. Lord, I pray for specific Freedom Baptist Church family members who are hurting and struggling, you know who they are. Lift them up and encourage them. And Lord, for that enemy in our life, would you stop them from doing wrong and turn their hearts to you? And would you use us to lead those enemies to Christ if that is possible? Father, bless the rest of the prayer time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.